if you do have any issue with anything that we talked about today. Um, so the way that obviously we've got a lot of candidates today, we've got 13 people on the stage. Um, so the way that we're going to format is pretty straightforward. So we'll just ask a few basic questions, who you are, um, what you enjoy, why you're running for the position, some of your policies, and then I think what we'll do is we'll open up to the crowd and see if we have any questions out there. And then if we still find we've got a lot of time afterwards, um, I'll ask some follow-up questions. So, without further ado, I think we'll kick things off. Um, what I'd love from you guys is just a basic introduction, your name, potentially what you study, and then maybe something interesting about yourselves. Mix it up. So, I'll let you kick things off. Okay, so I'm Sam, I'm, I'm going for the role of finance officer. I'm studying law and politics, and I took a gap year and lived in Japan. Uh, hey guys, I'm Cody. I am rerunning for finance officer this year. Uh, I studied law, uh, commer uh, finance, and PPE. Uh, one of the things I really believe in for USA is that we need to make sure that this organisation, this organisation that's been around for over 100 years, is still here in 100 years to come. And to do that, we need to make sure that OUSA remains financially viable. So that means making sure we're getting the most out of every dollar we spend. One of the things I personally want to do uh, if I get into the role next year is to uh, take a look at the assets that we have, um, specifically the aquatic centre and the squash courts, and see what we can do with those, really make the most of them. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm running on the ticket of unity. And that's because I believe we are best placed to form an effective executive for next year. Cheers. I'll, I'll just remind, we're just, uh, we're just after a little bit about ourselves and we'll get to policy and all the other details very shortly. Hey everyone, I'm Cam and I'm running for Vice President. I'm fourth year Law and Politics student. Um, I'm running on the B-Bowl ticket. And something interesting about myself, I'm actually in first year law. Kia ora koutou, uh, my name is Guy, ko Guy Taku Ingoa, uh, no Rahui Poke Ka Hau. Uh, my name is Guy and I come from a little town called Huntley Rahui Poke Ka, ko Waikato Te Awa, ko Taupere Te Maunga. Uh, my uh, life has been mostly by uh, the uh, Waikato River and I've lived in the um, shadow of Taupere uh, Te Maunga where uh, many important people in Kingitanga are buried. Um, I study law, I have a politics degree already, um, I have come here from, as I say, a little uh, town in Huntley and I didn't quite think I would make it to such a prestigious and respectable uh, university like this, but here I am, and just in time to resist some disastrous plans uh, that are happening at the moment. So I do encourage you to vote for me as Admin Vice President and also the rest of the Justice Through Solidarity ticket. Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, my name's Bryn. It's great to see such a great turnout here today. Um, I'm running for Administrative Vice President on the Unity ticket for a bunch of other members. Um, something interesting, I guess I've got a level one certificate in sign language, so I felt that was something pretty cool to go out and try something a bit different. I think I'd encourage all other students to do the same. Hi, my name's Gordon Dixon. I'm one of the mature students on campus. I'm promoting the, the need for mature student recognition amongst the um, Students Association. I'm a father of four, I'm born around here, and um, I'm studying law and politics, I'm a quantity surveyor, and my part-time I drive and guide tourists around the South Island, and a little bit of Europe, a little bit of Africa. Kia ora koutou everyone, uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm running for welfare officer on the E-Bowl ticket. Um, a fun fact about me, um, I'm Palestinian, I'm not sure what denotes the fun and fun fact, but yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Abby and I'm also running for welfare and I'm running on the unity ticket with a few other people up here. Um, I study maths, anatomy and music, which is a really weird combination, but that's a long story. Um, maybe that's my interesting thing. <laughs> I also play Javanese gamelan. Hello, kia ora tato. Um, ko karataki ingwa. Um, I'm a criminology, gender studies and uh, English student. Um, I am a spoken poet, I'm a local activist, and I really like memes. Um, and I'm running for student welfare as well as education officer. You can vote for me twice, I don't really care which one I get. I'd be really happy to fight for students' rights, because I think they've been eroded for far too long. And um, yeah, justice through solidarity, that's our ticket, that's what we're about. Uh, g'day, I'm James, I'm your current colleges officer, and I'm running to be your education officer uh, this year. 
Uh, fun fact about me, I can play the ukulele, not very well, but I can still play it. <laughs> Woo! Uh, hey guys, um, I'm Laura and I'm also running for your education officer. I am in my second year studying a BA in politics. Um, and my fun fact, I took a less than traditional path to uni. I did two years as a soldier in the New Zealand Army. Thank you very much to you all, some very interesting facts there. Uh, what I think we'll do now is because there are so many candidates up here, uh, 13, in, well actually there's this, isn't there? 12. Um, what we'll do is I'll ask some questions and we'll split it up into each different portfolio. So I'll begin with the administrative VPs. Uh, so Gordon, do you perhaps want to grab the microphone there and start? And the first question which I'll ask first of the administrative VPs is what is it that you believe the job involves and what is it that you believe you can bring to this job and do differently? And I think what the job involves is accountability of the OUSA, not just the money. I think basically your fees should go to OUSA, they should do a budget at the university, not the other way around. And currently, like our building, the law building is having fire sprinklers put every night. Now, I wrote to the president about this, he didn't have the courtesy of reply. Now, that's why I'm saying accountability, and we've got to use our constitution, and we've got to amend it to get accountability. So that's why we bring, I've chaired conservation boards and quangos and stuff like that, so I know um, how to have input and to use the rules that exist to get accountability. Uh, the administrative vice president role is effectively the internal support role on the executive. It's, it's the role that keeps the executive ticking and ensures all the executive officers are uh, operating as efficiently as possible, someone they can talk to for advice, someone who acts as that communication uh, link between executive officers and between the president. Now they do that in a number of ways. You do that through your, week, your regular catch-ups with executive members, you do that through regular weekly meetings with the president, you also do that by overseeing policy and overseeing um, the more um, structural elements of OUSA, uh, under, overseeing the constitution, overseeing meeting processes, ensuring everything is done fairly, and ensuring everything is done in the best student interests. Now I think I am by far the best person to do that job, because it's a job where you need experience to do it properly. You need to know how OUSA works, you need to know how the university works, so that you can both um, guide the internal process of OUSA, and also um, empower your fellow executive members to get the most out of their, their initiatives and their programs and knowing where to go in the university to get traction. So I'd very much like a vote for myself and a vote for unity. Cheers. Kia ora. So uh, what does the job entail? Well, actually I've read the constitution, I understand the basics of what the job uh, entails. It's part bookkeeping, it's part compliance, and uh, I've been a civil servant uh, for 13 years. I've worked to the Dunedin City Council for seven and a half years. I know that building inside out and everyone in it. Um, and I have a few um, uh, connections with the uh, councillors uh, who have been elected recently as well. Um, so what qualities do I bring? Well, I just mentioned some of them. Um, I'm also a, a union uh, recruiter, uh, so I have uh, lots of experience in campaigns and getting people together, and especially under difficult circumstances. Um, I come from a working class background, so I actually understand what issues are affecting people like students and uh, working families, and especially those who are, in, instead of getting an adequate uh, support, uh, from their living costs have to rely on their families who are struggling at home as well. And I think that uh, my involvement in politics in the past has given me a very good understanding of the political system and the ways and the strategies required in order to uh, get what we need and resist the conditions that we're forced to accept here at University of Jolly. I think uh, Bren outlined the very boring parts of Administrative Vice President. Uh, the key being in the name, admin. I think we can make that role way more optimistic and way more representative of students. It's more than just hosting meetings, it's more than participating in meetings, it's more than just shuffling papers around each week. I think we can really represent students next year and if I was elected Administrative Vice President, I would make one promise to you right now. I will wear each and every one of you on, the, on my sleeve because that's what I want to see in the exec. And it's much more than admin, it's much more than shuffling papers or enjoying the view from OUSA office. It's actually about representing students. So that's why I want to be elected and I hope for your support. Cheers. Thank you very much to all the admin VP uh, candidates there. Uh, Cam, the view from our office ain't, ain't actually too good. So. Um, Alright, we'll move on now to the finance uh, portfolios. 
Uh, it looks you, pretty good from down here, mate. Yeah. Cody, okay, we'll begin with you. Um, it's, the, it's the same question, but I think it's probably a bit tough to ask it of you, Cody, because obviously you're running for the same position. Um, so what is it that you believe you could have done better this year that you hope to do next year? I think um, one of the things that I definitely uh, am going to work on, and one, things that I, one of the things that I could have done, is being a bit more proactive in the role. Um, with finance, there's a lot, of, a lot of bookkeeping, a lot of signing, a lot of accountability, you're looking at numbers all the time, and you can get bogged down. I think there's definitely possibilities there to really uh, put your hand up and actually get involved in other things that's going around. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be financially related, some of it's politically relatable, um, some of it's just general executive work. And I think that if you're in the mindset within the finance role that, oh, I'm just going to show up, I'm going to do the financial work, I'm going to make sure that's done properly and I'm going to go home, then you're letting your fellow executive members down. You're letting them down because for them to be the best they can be in their roles, they really need the support of their entire executive. And that's really the idea we're running behind with Unity, is that we're here to support each other. And so that's one of the things that I hope to do better next year. Excellent. Um, so obviously I'm not the current finance officer, but if I were to be next year, um, one of the main things I'd like to see is the university, uh, the Students Association work towards being financially independent, looking for um, new ways to create revenue and investment. If you look at other student, student associations across New Zealand, a lot of them own cafes and bars and, and they're able to um, put that money back into students in a way that we can't quite do that because we're obviously being supported by the university. So obviously this can't happen overnight, but we would like to you know, start investigating new ways and, and being creative and being bold and um, ultimately looking at ways we can be um, independent and not being um, hold, held, holding the hand of the university and allowing us to be able to choose where we want to put that resource back into. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. I'll just get the um, microphone down to... Uh, Kyle, we'll start with you, uh, the education on the end there. Um, what is it that uh, you believe is the role of the education officer and what would you bring to the role that is different from the current education officer? Um, okay, so um, I think it's really important to think about how education is connected up to other issues and can't be separated from those issues. So when we're thinking about education and we're wanting people to have equal opportunity and access, that means that they must have well-being and fair treatment. And part of that is having that decent housing, having like you know money that's enough to live on, to survive and thrive, not just be scraping by or actually struggling. Um, so if we're thinking about education, we need to be thinking about housing, we need to be thinking about mental health and well-being, we need to be thinking about suicide and mental illness, um, we, need to think, we need to be thinking about how this is racialised and classed and gendered and all of those other things. Um, and so for me it's not about separating it out and being like, oh, should we like have a little workshop and show them how to use highlighters to colour coordinate their notes. I think students know how to study, but I think they need to have their material conditions radically improved and shifted. Um, so that instead of being given sort of like hot tips on how to sleep, we need to look at how overassessed students currently are and how much debt they're being put into, and then going, oh hey, maybe if like people had more time and more energy and a better environment around them, they would be able to sleep and they would be able to get up the next day and get to class and focus and like actually be here for what we're for, which is for learning and for engaging with each other. So for me, that's why I'm running for education and welfare officer because I don't really see education and welfare as separable. So I'm happy to be either, I'm happy to be both, I don't think you can be both. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I see education. And I remember when I was reading the constitution, it was saying about sort of, you know, improving things, strengthening things, and it was, it was a bit vague, but I think we could really pinpoint that down to the material conditions that students are in and how that would feed into them having a thriving situation for their education. Yeah. So, education officer is probably better named academic officer. The role of an education officer is to spearhead the OUSA's approach on university academic committees and boards. It's incredibly important to know that an understanding of committees, the difference between bugs, bogs, QAP, VCAC, all the various university slogans and sayings. That is where the education officer operates. They operate within the framework of the university. That's, I think, why it's very important that we have an education officer who has experience, who has experience with these boards so they know exactly what they're doing. So from the 1st of January, they can start doing rather than start learning. It takes six months to get here around all of these processes, so it's really important we have you know, experience uh, within this role. 
I think, going back to Hugh's question, I think the thing that I'll bring this year, personally myself, is a much more outgoing, outward fo fo focusing academic or education officer. I think it's really important to do the uh, committees inside committees and academic representation things, but at the same time, I think it's important to be communicating with student associations and really getting out there. Um, so sorry, but I'm going to have to completely disagree with James there. I think uh, any role on the executive ultimately boils down to advocacy and representation. Um, that is what I am running for, to advocate and represent the students. Now specifically in an education role, that means that I will be standing outside in the protest against humanities and PT cut, PE cut. It means that I will be meeting with our local MPs and telling them what we need to be doing for the best interests of the students. It means talking to the university, coordinating with departments and ensuring that while we're at university, this is the best time that we can have. That as Kyra said, Kyra said um, our well-being and our education is looked after because I agree that those things are definitely interrelatable. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to Welfare now. Abigail, you want to kick things off? So the, the question once again is, what do you see the role of Welfare Officer as, and what would you bring differently to the role uh, that hasn't already been there? Sure, so I see the Welfare Officer role as any role in the executive as twofold. So firstly is being a general executive member, sitting out on the meetings, passing motions, sitting out on committees that are relevant to your role, such as the Welfare Committee, and generally working with the executive to make to advocate for students' rights. Um, also, the welfare role more specifically is running campaigns and initiatives that affect students' welfare, and generally representing the student voice and advocating for student welfare. So, two things that I want to do is around mental health and well-being. I think that's so, so important. There's a few things we've got in the pipeline for that, such as doubling down on initiatives such as Silverline, which I think is wonderful. And also, I would love to run a safe relationships campaign with Norhan, our college's officer on the unity ticket as well. You can only do this if you've got an executive that works together. So that's what I would love to do. Um, so I see the welfare <laughs> officer as representing student welfare um, on the executive. That is absolutely crucial. Um, I, a, a lot of reform needs to come in this area because currently we don't have a safe campus environment. Um, we need better mental health on campus. Um, one thing that I would like to see is a welfare RA in every residential college because currently coming into first year we have, it's a struggle. Um, first year is a struggle regardless. Um, and yeah, so welfare RA in every residential college, reform for mental health and um, a safer campus environment. Um, I just wanted to talk to what you said before about um, fighting for for staff and and how student and staff well-being is not disconnected. Um, you know, when morale is incredibly low because you have people's uh, you know ability to survive being threatened by their jobs being at risk and pretty much already decided with something that's being called a consultation but doesn't actually feel like a consultation for staff. Um, and how you know when staff are incredibly stressed and depressed and very threatened, um, that's going to impact students and it is impacting students. It's very concerning and deeply upsetting. And so I think an integral part of student welfare under the current conditions in which our university is in is fighting for staff and standing with them and supporting them. So definitely I will be at the protests. I've already been at the protests. I think it was like three and two weeks. It was, it was exhausting but it was worth it. And. Um, I think as well, like it's important to remember what OUSA is, or at least claims to be, in its constitution, it is a union, right? It's not a service provider, it's actually a union. And what a union does is a union fights for people's rights. It doesn't work alongside with an institution that is actively exploiting students. So that actually doesn't mean that we can be all chum buddy friendly with Miss Hayne or whoever else. It actually means that we need to be talking very sternly to them and showing them the power that we have and how we're not happy with the current conditions. 
I'm not happy with the current conditions. And many of my friends and people who they're friends with, who have very like low mental well-being as a result of these conditions, they're not happy either. And that's not how I want it to be. I'd like everyone to be thriving, as I said before. And so in terms of what I would be bringing to this position, it would be one grounded in and a lot of personal experience regarding mental hardship. Um, and um, a big thing for me is um, shifting the way that OUSA sees itself and what students who work for OUSA would be doing. So instead of being like, oh yes, we're a service provider, let's give students some socks while they have freezing housing, let's give students a hot water bottle and act like you know damp flats aren't really an issue and that we shouldn't be campaigning for housing rights and increased living costs that the national government is pushing us into and has been eroding for you know the last eight years that they've been in government. Um, I think we need to be looking bigger, we need to be looking more structurally rather than just kind of responding to things and trying to hand people a few freebies like that's going to solve these massive systemic issues that we have as a country but also as a student community locally. Um, so I'd be really concerned with having those conversations, having an open discussion with students and about, about their material conditions rather than just kind of you know, handing them pamphlets as if pamphlets are a form of suicide prevention. Excellent. So yeah, All right. Kira. Thank you. Well, I'll move the um, microphone to the end. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, have we got one more for welfare? No. Oh, we're all done? Excellent. All right, yeah, we'll move the microphone along to the end, back to the stage. <laughs> um, the, the one question, we'll go across everyone and then we'll open the uh, floor up for questions. Um, is what do you think at the current moment is the biggest issue facing students and what will you do to tangibly improve that issue? I think um, looking at a wider scale, the biggest issue is that there currently isn't a strong representative body that represents student interests and therefore um, issues such as mental health, living conditions, um, tertiary costs aren't actually, don't have a strong voice coming from the students. Um, and again, that comes back to if we can be more independent as um, a student association, then that's things that we can be able to address on a more firmer level, have a stronger student voice, um, because currently that's lacking in the student cohort. I think it would be wrong to just say there's one issue that overarches every, everything else and, and affects every single student. It depends on who you are and what your situation is as to what would be uh, the most important issue to you. Some people definitely mental health, um, other people it's going to be your cold flat, other people it's going to be the fact that you're doing three years at university, a $30,000 degree and then you kind of come out of it and hope for a job and find out that there actually isn't one for you at the other end. So the, the very, the idea that, you know, OUSA is here to, you know, fix everything with the magic wand is sort of a bit on the edge and the fact that there's one issue that's affecting everyone is also a bit on edge. The best that we can hope for is to try to provide, um, you know, an amazing experience at Otago University for our for our members of our association, and it's to, to advocate on their behalf in university committees and to the government when we submit on on bills. It's it's doing all these things and it's doing all these things great that I think um, is OUSA's place at Otago. I think stronger, more transparent representation. Because at the end of the day, as Cody said, there are a number of issues that affect students. And if lucky enough to be elected, we are those people who have to fight against or fight for some of those issues for students. One of those issues obviously is mental health or mental well-being. Uh, it's actually a little bit bigger than that. It's just well-being in general. So I think the university could be doing a whole lot more with, with well-being. So with regards to mental health, um, housing, I think the state of Deneen Flats is horrendous and it absolutely contributes to mental health and just general health in general. Um, if you look at student health, for example, the waiting list is just massive and it's and with uh, mental health appointments capped at six, I don't think that's good enough. Mental health is secured in six sessions as far as I'm concerned. And that's something that we, that strong representation on the exec will help fix, I believe and uh, we'll stand up for some of those main issues such as mental health, uh, such as transparency in the exec, such as actually reforming OUSA into, a, into an organisation that represents students and fights for them.
Got a cat. So what are the biggest issues uh, for students? Well, first of all, uh, this is a good turnout, but back in the day, this room used to be full to the broom, standing room only. Hour long, hours long meetings, massive debates, and uh, together we found uh, a way. Um, but I think what the biggest issue is, is this university's administration. It is coming down on students who want to bring up issues, and also I just want to um, highlight that the relationship that the current OUSA has established with the university is one of an ambassadorial, uh, managerial style. So that means they get the line from the university and then they tell us that that is the limit and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we can strategize uh, to change the law we can strategize to change the law under the Education Act so we can have universal student membership again and have full control over OUSA's financial um, abilities. Um, the other thing is obviously the uh, other things that um, Kyra mentioned um, and what a welfare officer we would have in her. Please make sure you do vote uh, for her and um, you know housing, uh, the uh, situation with mental health, uh, people are seriously falling through the gaps there. Um, I've got mates who are struggling and we can't look after them on our own. We need um, assistance uh, from society to do that because uh, all together we can um, help fix those problems and make this a safer society for everybody. Um, and um, other issues um, also as uh, Kyra brought up, uh, the massive workload that we have to deal with. We used to have three semesters. Uh, we only had, we had to take fewer papers per semester and the assessment load was a lot more manageable, a lot more reasonable. The thing is we're coming here to learn how to think critically, not how to fit all the possible work into every single hour possible just to make profits for people who tell us what to do even though they haven't done our job one day in their life. Um, I do believe the biggest issue facing students right now is mental health. Um, in the last month I've had both um, a, a colleague of mine and, a, and flatmates of mine who have lost a flatmate, who have lost another one, lost um, a close school friend. Last year I lost someone who I had done, had worked with in my first year commerce paper who I was still in contact with on Facebook. This is wrong that we're having students feeling like they've got nowhere to go. But I don't think the solution is necessarily upending everything OUSA does in doing the support. It's about highlighting the steps that have already been taken and building on those as a unified force to get them going all the much further. So in the part in my, my two years on the executive, I've been to Parliament, I've lobbied for these rental standards, I've spoken before select committee and we've argued to have better flats here in Dunedin. We've brought about free flu jabs. It started as a small pilot last year, blossomed out into a far larger approach this year so we can try and get health back on track as helping students with one more thing. Our Student Support Centre does some amazing work and we just need to get them out there, get them more vocal, get them in the university's eye and get the university supporting the work that we already do. This is a case of, if you have an executive that is unified, if your executive is working together and works with the amazing staff members we already have, with the, with the amazing people in the community we already have. We've got members on our ticket like Finn and Abigail who are working with the Silver Line Festival to give new, unique and creative ways to engage with students and make them get some time out, have some fun and, and get that break on campus. We're working with, um, with Norhan's working in, in the colleges to get the Safe Relationships campaign. There's plenty of areas we're looking at. The, the issue is you need these to be done and you need them to be followed through. And to do that you need an executive that's working together. You need an executive that doesn't look at projects as if they are a welfare project or an education project. Every project the executive does is an executive project. Every, everything the executive does is accountable to the executive as a whole, not individual executive members. That's something I've pushed for this year. I've pushed for us having plans. I've pushed for us for being open on that. I've pushed for us to go out there and talk to students more. I've pushed for us to have binding referendums. These are all things we can do to ensure the executive delivers more for you, and it's something that will happen if you vote for our unity team and our ideals that we believe in. Jordan, well, I think the greatest thing that's facing this university is the student apathy when it comes to voting. Now, all I'd like you to do is to go out there and tell 10 people to tell 10 other people and they've got to get off their backsides and they've got to vote. Now, I've got to be very careful what we're saying because I'm actually a suspended member of the New Zealand Labour Party. 
So I had to be very, very careful because when Jacinda Ardern turned up here just recently, she had some pre-circulated questions to her and her and David Clark never answered them. So I've got to be very, very careful. Okay, so what I'd like also to see, I'd like some scrutineering and voting. Uh, I'd like to see a full-time proctor would be a good thing too. And it, it is your future, you know. The sea level is rising, you know. We t I took our, court, our council to court in 1992 <coughs> about this. We're still not learning, you know. You're going to need weird feet very soon, you know. So please, tell people they've got to get off their backsides, they've got to get out and vote. Uh, and please, don't trust the current bunch of politicians. I've contested three general elections for the New Zealand Labour Party, including the last one. It was filthy, okay? It was really, really filthy. So, Kira Gora. Um, I think that one thing really important, just quickly, um, is that OUSA is apolitical. We don't have, um, we don't support a party, we don't, we support policy. We support policy that will further students. Um, and so that means not getting up here and bagging any party. Um, Sorry. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> uh, the question was, what do you think the biggest issue facing students is at the current moment and what would you do to um, So I think that mental health is by far the biggest issue facing students. Um, Bryn touched on it very well. Um, it's a difficult one because, I mean, everyone knows someone that's had problems with mental health. Everyone also knows someone that's had a trouble with the mental health system. Um, and we, we have ads on television telling us to, to go and talk to someone if we need it. We see the ads on Facebook and Instagram, they're everywhere. But we don't have anyone to talk to. Um, and I think two ways that I would like to see um, that change. Firstly, I briefly touched on it, having a welfare officer um, in every residential college. Obviously, that will only help um, first-year students or second-year returning. Um, but one thing I would also like to see is the, um, Cam touched on this as well, the am amount of sessions that you can see lifted um, because we really need good mental health on campus. It affects everything we do. So I see student welfare as being the biggest problem. Uh, we've touched on that today as well. Mental health is so, so important. Um, I think we've said everything that needs to be said about how important mental health is. Like we said, everyone knows someone that's been affected by depression, anxiety, and all the other mental health problems that come along with it. I see mental health as being something that requires a holistic approach. We don't can't just say, oh, um, we all do this and then that'll fix the problem. There's, you've got to take a wide level approach to it and run a few different things just to target different people. Everyone reacts to different initiatives, different counsellors, different systems in different ways. And if we put everyone in a box and say, oh, everyone's going to react to something this way, then we're going to be shutting out all those students who aren't going to do that. Um, that's why as welfare officer, we'll be in our ensure best health policy on the unity ticket, we've got a wellness centre in the pipeline, we've got, we're have got we going to double down initiatives like Silver Line, we want to increase the support to student support because they're already doing amazing, amazing work and just not enough people know about it. <coughs> so that's what I want to do, that's what I see as the biggest problem. We've got to take a holistic approach to this. Thank you. Um, so in terms of what the biggest issue facing students right now, I think there's a lot of issues and they all kind of link back to this big kind of monster of the university being this neoliberal corporatized run for profit education factory where students are incredibly dehumanized and treated like units for profit and there's just kind of numbers floating around on our heads of how much we're spending to be here and you kind of wonder like if you're a consumer or a product and you don't really know. Um, so I would see that the university being run for profit, where you know you're being overcharged on campus for food, and there's like not very good, many good options and healthy options available on campus. Um, they're willing to take you know fees from 20,000 of us, but they're not willing to provide healthcare for 20,000 of us. So you know you'll be suicidal and get kicked out of student health, and they'll be like, oh sorry, like we're just trying to do a short-term approach. That's actually not fucking good enough, yeah. and we know that. That's, it's actually putting people's lives at risk and I don't fucking care if I'm swearing too much right now because it fucks me up. So, 
I think that mental health, and poor mental health specifically, is one very key part of, the, of this institution being run as a for-profit company that does not care about our well-being. A business has shown itself to not be capable of caring about our well-being. So I think we need to be directly challenging what it means for this institution to be run in a way that dehumanises us and sees us as only capable of something to produce profit from. So I think while having services is important, I think if the only way we conceptualise dealing with students' poor mental health is providing services rather than looking at the conditions which provide fertile ground for mental illness, then we're really missing the point. Like, part of it, as I said, shit housing. Another part of it, not enough to live on. Another part of it, getting overassessed. Another part of it, massive, massive amounts of debt. Like, we probably owe multiple millions within this room, potentially. I don't know, it's pretty high, and it's stressful. So, like, I think, you know, having little conferences, um, or maybe slightly big conferences, I don't know what size, Unity's planning in a very unified way. Um, but I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think at this point we need more than conferences and more than pamphlets, and I'm not trying to bag on the good work that Student Support does, or like how caring and amazing some of the people at Student Health are. These people, they really do care, and they put in a lot of hard work and a lot of effort, but ultimately, they're not being resourced enough, and they're not being funded enough, and so we need to be looking at this in, looking at this in a structural way, rather than merely being like, oh, I don't know, we'll try our best. We actually need to really radically change things. So, yeah, neoliberalism, it's shit. Really? All right, thank you. Thanks. So I think the solution we're seeing for problems, problems like mental health, other problems like planning issues, is communication. Communication is lacking. We're operating in silos at the moment, and we're all bringing up these great solutions, but we need to bring them all together and communicate about them. We need to stop operating in these silos and actually work together and bring up the best options, discuss it, have this, have this discussion and finding the best option. I also think, for a bit of change, I think another issue that students are facing is weekly costs. I mean, you've seen the Labour government coming up with a $50 increase to the weekly costs. I think that's fantastic to see, and I think OUSA, through NZUSA, needs to lobby for similar policies like that. Students are struggling to live off their hundred and seventy odd dollars a week, and we need to improve that. I think that's a big thing that's facing students. Yeah, well, we've all heard, like, the range of, of issues, and I agree with basically what everyone here has said. Ultimately, for me, it boils down to well-being. Um, the most urgent issue for me as a student is that, we've said it before, mental health, overall well-being, we have got to do something better about this because as Kyra said, it was Kyra, um, people are dying and that's just not acceptable. I have been to student health, I've struggled with mental illness, it took me two weeks to get an appointment and then a further two weeks to get a follow-up. That is not okay. If someone was suicidal, four weeks to wait only to be told after six sessions that that's it, you're cured or you're done, is completely unacceptable to me and it's not something that I'm going to sit here and take. Um, in addition, I think, so obviously it's not OUSA's job to provide counselling, I acknowledge that, but it is our job to advocate for these kind of changes to the university and so that's what we need to be seeing. Um, I'd also like to advocate for either the lifting of, I mean, you go to student health and we barely acknowledge it, it costs at least $10 for a session. So if you go for six sessions, that's $60. That is not something that a lot of students have. We've talked about the lack of living costs. Some people are trying to live off $10 food a week. To say you've got mental health issues, you need support, but try and pay for it, I think is unacceptable as well. So that's something that I want to work on. It's something that needs to happen. Excellent, thank you all uh, candidates. Um, so my throat's getting pretty dry, so I'll open up the floor to anyone who has questions, hands up. Joel, we'll begin with you. Um, if you could either ask the questions of the candidates, it would be a little easier, or everyone as a whole. So Joel. Uh, my question's for Bryn. In your candidate statement and critic, you claim that you pioneered the initiative of free graduation photos. That initiative has been in place since before you were education officer, and the previous education education officer has claimed that you're trying to take credit for her initiative. Will, will you retract your claim? 
In that statement, I said I'm the, I was pioneering the initiative for free flu jabs and providing free graduation photos at every graduation this year. I'm the only, um, I, it's the first time OUSA has offered free graduation photos at every graduation. Certainly, Alexia ran the campaign last year, but it only ran for a, a handful of the graduation sessions. I've been offering it every single session this year because I don't think students should miss out just because the executive's gone home in December. So I've already arranged, I have the budget there, I have the volunteers there, and we're ensuring we're delivering to those students at the end of the year. Excellent, thank you. Any more questions? Hands up. Sam, thank you. Um, my question is for the, the Unity candidates, but um, anyone else is, is welcome to, to jump in if they've got opinions on this as well. Uh, so your, um, your mission statement is very heavy on, on service provision. And um, yesterday at the, uh, at the forum for the, for the other positions, for the officer positions, um, some of your candidates referred to OUSA as a company your um, candidate for campaigns officer said that the biggest issue facing students was um, glass in Castle Street. Um, I'm just wondering, do you see OUSA as a political body at all? And if so, how is that reflected in your platform? Absolutely, I'd agree. OUSA is a political body, but I would also argue it has a duty to look after students. OUSA in its mission statement itself says it is there to provide quality <laughs> services to students. That is something that I think OUSA needs to do, is OUSA's best place to be able to offer those services on the ground and more dynamically than other organisations can, and I think it's something OUSA is doing very well. Now, yes, OUSA needs to have more of a voice as a political force. I think we need to be more active, particularly in the way our budgets work with the university, to be more transparent with students, we need to be more transparent with what, we're, what OUSA is paying for and what the university is paying for. We need to go out and make this a discussion point throughout the year. That's our intention with the forums. We want to have the Vice-Chancellor down here asking questions as to why or why not certain things are being funded. Now, that also goes to a national level. We've already spoken. We think we need to utilise NZUSA more to lobby um, in, at government and at government level. We had a very productive meeting with Jono, the president of NZUSA, the other day, yes, yesterday in fact. But we need to do that more. And we need to show the students more how that is happening and get their input into that process more. So absolutely, I'd agree. We're not doing enough on the political front, but I would disagree in that I still strongly believe we need to be providing these services to students. Does that answer your question, sir? <laughs> Anyone else want to get, have anything more to add? Yeah, I, I like James. I also agree that Brenda has answered really well for us all. So I think while it's great that OUSA is keen to provide for students, I think we need to be thinking about how um, irresponsible. It is for our university to be not providing things and pushing that off onto our student union, which is actually meant to be fighting and advocating for our rights and should not be caught up trying to sort of mismatch and put things together when our university is refusing to provide care and support for us, yet is willing to brag about it in their parents' guides and pamphlets that they you know, hand out when they're marketing themselves to, to um, prospective students and their families. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think Bryn's absolutely right. Um, OUSA needs to be more political, but unfortunately it's just too late in election year now. I mean, where, where, was, where was OUSA being political when Bryn was on the exec uh, for the whole year this year? Or even the year before? We've seen, some really, we've seen some really, really good tertiary education policies come out from, to be fair, quite a wide range of parties this election. OUSA has not endorsed any of it. Um, I, I still think we shouldn't endorse a party, I think that's inherently wrong. But I think OUSA needs to actually endorse policy that benefits students. And actually, we can't hold referenda on this because at the end of the day, we're elected to do a job, not elected to just hold referendums, which any old person could do. So that's what I think we need to do in election year. We actually need to say, yes, this policy is going to benefit our students, and we're going to lobby for that.
to answer the Sam's question directly, we are a political organisation, but we are actually more than that. We are a political force, and it requires students to vote for Labour and the Greens, as we typically do, if we look at the demographics, and they are going to win election this year. But that's, that's the easy part. Getting them in office is the easy part. We need to hold them to account for the fact that we've given them our votes, and uh, we need to press on them for better conditions here at university. And uh, we, we will most likely get a new tertiary minister next year, and a lot of the positions of the tertiary uh, on the university council, part of which is uh, appointed by the tertiary minister, are going to expire at the end of this year. So we get to exert some force on who gets to manage this university. So make sure that uh, when you do vote, you keep that in mind. It's the easy part, getting them in office, but it's the hard part, keep holding them to account, but much easier than holding Nash to account, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask all the candidates just a quick two second answer. Which one role have you held in the past that you think qualifies you for the position that you are running for today? As in which role on the OSA, or just the... Um, oh, I, I was the deputy boy in my school, I think that gave me a bit of leadership experience and the ability to work with other people and yeah, make change. Uh, the finance officer of OUSA for this year. <laughs> uh, University Grange, Crew Club co-captain, uh, head coach and current captain of the top team. God, look, I should have brought my CV. Look, I'm a union recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I've got a great CV. I've been in the civil service for 13 years. I've worked in Dunedin City Council, South Taranaki District Council, Waikato District Council, rep, rep, rep. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, so yeah, this morning we were at a First Union uh, annual general meeting uh, where uh, my uh, colleague and uh, campaigns officer candidate uh, Anger spoke this morning uh, to uh, members which he helped get into that union. He's helping get uh, better wages. Um, sorry, now what was the thrust of your question again, sorry? Just which one role you <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, I had a lot to choose from, but there's some of them. <laughs> again, I've got off in a big list, but I do think executive experience, my time as education officer and welfare officer has been invaluable. In 1987, we've got, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. We've, got, we've got a new act of parliament called the Conservation Act. Now, we all know it's about 26% of our nation's crown. Now, the minister appointed me to chair the first conservation quango in the Bay of Plenty, and from there, I orchestrated the New Zealand Council um, to actually talk with us so we could talk to DOC, so we had public input. It was very, very difficult, but that, that was something so. And this other fellow said he had a CV. He didn't bring it, so how do we know he's telling the truth? <laughs> um, at the risk of endorsing any political party, I'd say the position uh, would be Chair of Southern Young Labour and Vice President of Young Labour. And like a couple of others here, I probably have a few to choose from, so I'm finding this a little difficult right now. But um, the one most relevant probably is I've been an OUSA queer support intern all this year, which is a role I've absolutely loved, and it's given me great inside knowledge to OUSA. Um, so I haven't worked for OUSA. Um, I haven't worked for that official service provider. Um, but I think thinking about professionalization and what it means to like have legitimate skills versus unrecognized skills, I reckon a role that's really prepared me for this kind of thing is a role of care, which I occupy in a lot of different positions, but particularly babysitting and formally looking after my young cousins who are essentially like nieces and nephews to me because they're so much younger than me, and supporting them with various concerns that they have, anxiety and um, sort of navigating relationships and, and growing up and that sort of thing. It's like really helpful to be in touch with what is a pressing concern and a current struggle for youth. And um, the other thing I'd say is as well, um, working with a local poetry collective and working with local high schoolers and about what makes them worry and what they care about. Um, it's really good. I, I feel really good being in touch with like what young people are concerned about. So that to me is what I would say. Obviously, the role of colleges officer puts me as the only uh, candidate for education officer with the necessary experience for this role. You mentioned that well, advocacy is important, and that's important for every single OUSA executive officer. But for the education officer portfolio itself, 
you need to have experience dealing with university committees and officials if you want to get the job done, and you're not going to drop the ball from past years. I think anyone can run for OUSA, but it's really valuable when you've got candidates that have the experience. No, I think you need a balance of fresh. You need to have a balance of fresh faces and candidates with an extra experience, and I think education officers are one of those that relies on experience. What's that? Yeah, I think we'll answer this question. We'll move on. All right, question. Um, so the thing that I have done this year that I am most proud of and that I think really suits me for a role on the executive is I have been a Red Cross volunteer for the Pathways to Resettlement Program, so uh, former refugees that have... <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so that has involved a huge role of advocacy for those that can't currently speak for themselves, and that's why I feel like I'm well suited for this role. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Right, more questions. Uh, my, one's, my one's for the welfare officers or wanting wannabes. Um, <coughs> short, short of um, short of complaining about student health and advocating to increase student health services, um, I understand OUSA is there to provide support services. Have you guys got any policies or ideas about how we could do that, whether it be in increasing uh, better eating or better flats, or have you guys got any actual um, some ideas? of how we could increase uh, mental health being something that needs to be a across the board change rather than just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff consultations. Um, cool, so I think something that OUSA could do uh, potentially better to um, improve things for students is to be connecting up with what local experts and support services do currently exist. So there's amazing services like rape crisis is needed, like male survivors of sexual abuse, like Shark D, which provides support for um, ethnic women who have um, linguistic needs relating to being uh, non-English speaking or speaking English as a second language. So I think um, tapping into and supporting and appreciating and acknowledging that work that already exists in our community and has decades worth of knowledge and sort of linking that up and building those relationships is something that could be really valuable, especially for um, more vulnerable students with sort of migrant, um, indigenous and sort of uh, international backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, I think we need to be thinking about how, you know, censoring things around English speakingness and English proficiency is really fucking privileged and not that nice. So um, I think that would be one really key example is like linking up with those local existing support services with lots of knowledge. Pardon? Well, I mean, you know, when you have students who are of a migrant background or are indigenous and then you have those local support services, if you speak with them and make relationships with, relationships with them so that you can refer students on to provide that specialised support would be an example of something that could be helpful. So that would relate to migrant and indigenous students. Excellent. So, um, I think it's so great what Kyra said, but I think it's really interesting that SAGE and the support staff at Student Support already do these things already. So if you ever come to them and you need help, they, they the Student Support staff go with you to these services out in the community and so they already help out with that. Um, so I think what I'd love to do is double down on that. Obviously students just don't know about these services that they provide and more students do need to know about them. Um, double down like, on the initiatives like Silver Line which is already doing wonderful things. Um, full disclosure I am helping out with the Silver Line Festival but um, in trying to be as unbiased as possible I do genuinely think it's wonderful and doing wonderful work already in the community. Um, and also I want to implement a safe relationships campaign in the colleges, so going into colleges, holding workshops around consent and what healthy relationships look like. Um, sexual violence is a huge contributor to mental health as well, so that's what I really want to do. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with what um, Abby and Kyra have said, um, but just quickly on student services, support services, I, like amazing work, incredible work, but there's still the ambulance at the bottom of the at the bottom of the cliff. We still need to do um, work to ensure that people don't have to go to them. Um, like obviously, <laughs> people are going to go to them, but we need to ensure that people have a warm, safe, dry home. We need to ensure that people. Um, 
aren't going to have their rents raised on them twice a year, which is currently um, completely possible. It's about ensuring that people feel safe and are safe. Excellent. Thank you. More questions? Um, this one's for admin VP and campaigns candidates, and it's about referendums. Um, admin VP candidates, sorry. Um, so with referendums, we've had a bunch that have uh, resoundingly won, and then we've seen pretty much no action from the OUSA uh, regarding those specific questions. Just a few examples. Uh, this year's referendum, uh, wiping student debt or asking the tertiary, uh, the tertiary education minister to wipe student debt, won in the referendum by 75%. Uh, opposing CCTV and changing the government also won, and we haven't really seen anything from the OUSA on that. Last year, they're uh, committing to oppose staff cuts. That won with 81.7% of the respondents to that referendum, and I can't remember seeing OUSA actually committing to um, going to lectures or providing posters or actually putting the significant resources it has into supporting those campaigns. So I just want from the admin VP candidates, um, what kind of active role will you commit OUSA to when these campaigns come up in the future and the ones that are ongoing now? And do you have any experience with those kind of street social movements to base it on? A heck of a question. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about it. Yes, I do. I do have a lot of experience working with committees. You, you have to use the structures in place. You have to lobby central government. You have to get bums off backsides and in, into groups to lobby, lobby your local parliamentarians, um, get people involved in the campaigns so you can actually make some form of change. And if you see you say I've got to get a little more political and spend a bit of money sending people to select committees, so be it. I've got to do it. I think one of the issues we've had in responding to some of those, particularly an example being the CCTV issue, is um, communicating back to the students the steps that have been taken. So for example, the meetings with the Vice-Chancellor, the meet emergency meetings we've had that have opened up the consultation process, opened up the forum here which had a chance for students to come in and have their say, has resulted in the document which is coming out, which is, has a compilation of all the written feedback from the students. And then that gives a very clear indication of the tangible changes that students want to be made in the implementation of this process, and then we can push to ensure those changes happen. I led the executor's um, response to the policy on the CCTV. It was, about a, it was a good two or three page critique of every individual clause we went through. So we're certainly doing things, but we're doing a poor job of showing you that we are, which is where we want to communicate that back. That's why we want to do things like these um, weekly videos. We can just have a discussion on, on Facebook, have it there so you can see. You can see what goes into making the decisions and also get a chance to have input into those. You can ask questions, have more feedback moving through. Because I think a lot does happen, but it isn't seen. Now, that being said, I do believe the best process to begin with is trying to push things through um, the established networks. I do think we've achieved things like free flu jabs because we've put it through the, the university's pathways. But that's not to say I'm not against going um, break, breaking down those pathways if we aren't being listened to. At the moment, I feel we are being listened to. At the moment, consultation processes are happening if students engage in them. At the moment, we're more than welcome people to turn up to exec meetings to give more information. And we're, our, our, we, we go out there and we do pass every little piece on. So it's something we have to improve on, but it's something we, we certainly can and we can certainly do better. Well, look, I can tell you what, being in civil service, I've been through many consultations and many submissions, and I can tell you, your, it is a bureaucratic process, and that's what Bryn is uh, expecting us to engage in, and that's not how we do things as students. We have big meetings, long debates, and then we find out what it is that we want to do and who has uh, the abilities uh, to lead that. Now, uh, secondly, uh, we have lots of causes going on at the moment. We had a PE school that came out of nowhere and led their own protest. Where was OUSA on that? We had staff support cuts um, being uh, opposed by students. Where was OUSA on that? There was a referendum, as Tyler points out. 
uh, that gave OUSA the ability, the mandate, to go against that. Where are the plans for that? We were behind closed doors talking with the individuals. Behind closed doors. Behind closed doors. Sorry, I'll, leave and we actually I'll, I'll leave it there, but look, the strategy that we need is to get people together and with the realisation of the political situation, <coughs> What we need is to bind students together as a positive force for change, and that's what we came here for initially. Um, we don't have to just go into some sort of boring, dead-end job at the end of this. Uh, we can actually like, form a world uh, that we want to be part of. Um, and uh, going back to the thrust of the question, look, you know, I am a student, I sit in class with students, I walk around with students, I party with students, uh, we work hard, play hard down here, and uh, you know, um, I listen, I listen and I talk, and so I don't actually need a referendum to tell me that we don't want to be spied on by CCTV cameras without any, without any consequences for a failure to adhere to any uh, rules made about the use of that uh, information. Um, and uh, we don't uh, need a referendum to tell us that students love their staff and want them around to uh, make this university a place where it affects both the staff and the students. So, you know, like, if we are elected, we've, we've kind of got the mandate to make those decisions, but that doesn't mean that we get to sit behind closed doors and make all the decisions and then tell you what the line is and then limit all debate on that. So, you know, let's cut out the bureaucracy, let's have our meetings, let's find out what's going on, um, and, you know, use our relationships to try and understand. And if there is a proper tricky... Um, uh, issue then. Of course, you know, referenda are good for that, but look, we were all students and we can all get together and talk and find out what those issues are and we don't need bureaucratic processes to limit the uh, debate. Yeah, look, it's a really good question and you cited the last two years of referendums and um, it's no coincidence that someone I'm running up against the same role uh, has just said he's doing everything he can, albeit apolitically, and yet OUSA has been completely stagnant on these issues. Um, I think OUSA actually has to take a stand. We're not elected to just cast referendums every week, asking what students think. Uh, never mind the fact that actually the results of those referendums actually gave the mandate for OUSA to stand up for those issues. Um, so I think OUSA does need to take a stand, and it's not good enough that they haven't been on issues of, C on, of CCTV, PE cuts, SSR, all those sorts of things. I think OUSA really, really has to lead from the front. And in terms of your last question with what experience do I have, I'll be honest with you, not a whole lot, but the experience I do have is that I'm genuine and I fight for what I believe in, and I believe that OUSA has not done enough, and I believe that CCTV, PE cuts, SSR, they're not good enough, and I'll bloody hell uh, spearhead those issues if I'm elected. Um, so this question's for the current uh, uh, vice administrator, vice president. A recent report on sexual violence on campus was incredibly critical. Oh, sorry. VP. Brendan. Is that right? Oh, education. Um, we'll go with it, sorry, Bryn. <laughs> Campus was incre um, incredibly critical of your leadership of Thursdays in Black in 2016. Was that correct? Was that yours? Yeah, that's correct. That was me who wrote that. Cool. That was critical of Bryn. In regards to that, do you think you've done enough to reduce sexual violence on campus so far? I think the steps we've seen made over the last two years on campus have been extraordinary and they've come about from all manner of different areas. I think the, the work that Clara's done, the work that the, um, the various groups around campus have been doing has certainly got this on the forefront of the agenda. Now, a, a lot of the work we did last year was unfortunately through university processes behind closed doors and that we were never able to discuss much of that but that work was being done. The university has a three-year plan that they're into the second year of now, of which the end of it, they're going to have all these policies in place, they're going to have these education programs in place, they're going to have 
the dedicated staff trained on campus in place to deal with these concerns. Now, this is where it gets difficult. It's not as simple as just going up to the university and telling them tomorrow they need to have this, thing, this in place. Yes, it is. It the absolutely is. Sorry, but it is. Yeah. The university, the university is responsible for the pastoral care of 18,000 students. Now, while I agree, yes, the university has moved slow on this, and yes, they need to do more, to say that they need to do it tomorrow well, it simply isn't practical. Can I just clarify, because I feel like what you're saying is a bit of misinformation. When we released that book, we actually broke up what our demands were into short term and long term, so we weren't actually asking for it overnight because we were predicting that we would be told, you can't just ask for this overnight. <laughs> and then we said And then we said that we would like immediate changes, midterm changes, and long-term changes so that people who might be overwhelmed by what we were talking about and what we were demanding would recognise that we saw this as something that needed to be acted on instantly, but also in a long-term, ongoing, dedicated way, right? So this isn't about, you need to do it right now, like, yes. You do need to do it right now, but... <laughs> you do need to do it right now, but also, like, we recognise that not everything can be done overnight, but it needs to be having something meaningful starting right now. This university has existed for more than 150 years and you're telling me that you can't have on-campus sexual violence support that just for like 150 years you didn't have the fucking time? That's really not good enough. That's disgusting. Absolutely. Much of that, what we read in that report was the first time IUS had received much of that information. And that's where it was very difficult in my role last year that this feedback never came to me. I never received an email. I never, I, those of you that were part of the First Days in Blake movement would have seen the posts I put on our closed Facebook page asking for feedback. That never came through. Our staff never received that feedback. Student support have never received that feedback. As soon as we receive that feedback, to my understanding, our president, our welfare officer, has met with your group and has worked through exactly how are you saying exactly how the university is going to move in the short term. And that is exactly and so as soon as we've been aware of those concerns, we have taken action. Now, obviously that action has been done by the current welfare officer, because that's not my role anymore anymore. Were those concerns brought to me last year, then exactly the same thing would have happened. I, on my welfare committee, had a number of students um, who, are, who were there and were providing feedback. We discussed these issues at length. I discussed it at length with people in the US, I discussed it with family, we discussed it with friends. We knew there were issues with the movement, we knew there were things people weren't happy with, but we were not going to make changes based on perceptions of what we thought was wrong, because we honestly didn't know. So what we wanted to know was what the problem was, and that is what we need at OUSA. We need, if students have a problem with something, to tell us, to talk to us. We can't make a change on a whim. I, sorry, Kyra, I met with you twice. Tw two organised meetings, and one meeting you turned up to that I wasn't expecting. That was for another issue. But I met with you one on one twice, and then once you came to one Thursdays and Black meeting. I was aware you weren't happy with some things there, but then I received no communication as to what those problems were. Now, I'm sorry, certainly I didn't take action on that. Because I I I'm very sorry about that, but I can only know what I know. I didn't know you're in hospital. I didn't know the book was being written. I didn't know these issues were. I didn't know those demands were there. Now I'm sorry, but I'm not going. I, I can. I'm apologising for that. Our processes should have been better, and I've been very upfront about that. But and I would have loved to have made changes, but I didn't know what those changes were. Um, I just like to clarify as well. Um, we have met with the current president. Can we and have a conversation like this? Um, when we met with the current president, he repeatedly spoke over us and we didn't feel particularly we, valued in our We have not met, you have ambushed me, it's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
came this way our executive meeting and demanded that I meet with you in the hallway. Because we're your members, mate. Yes, which we had a meeting booked for that Friday, which was the earliest time that we could possibly meet. And apparently it wasn't early enough for you. You did not ask me for a meeting, I asked you for a meeting after the booklet. Anyway, continue. We tried to deliver it to you in person, and then you were at Harleen Hain's office instead. So Discussing we... the booklet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Discussing so, the details of so the booklet. Then you said that you had read our entire booklet, and then you suggested that we meet at a time when, if you had read it, you would have known that that was when we were calling for a public meeting. No, and I said the earliest available months. time that I had to meet with you was Friday afternoon. Is this and if that would have worked for you. Is this about sexual violence? Come on, guys. Alright, well, do you have a question or, or a statement? Alright, move. Um, just in, since I ran for, this, uh, execu ran for the executive, I've talked about Thursdays in Black to a couple of people, um, probably about six people in the last week, and the response I have had is, what? What is that? And that to me just shows what negligence this issue, this, um, the campaign, has had, and you've said it before, Bryn, two years you've had Thursdays in Black. The Students Against Sexual Violence booklet was written a few months ago? It took us six weeks, but it was written a couple of months ago. Yeah, a couple of months ago. Why were you not going to the people that you needed to talk to to get the campaign running efficiently far before now? Why is it taking you two years? Yeah, I'm going to give you the right to respond then. Sorry, I just want to clarify, I'm not welfare officer this year. I handed over my wife's office duties this year, including a full handover document to, our, to, uh, to Danielle, who has worked tirelessly on the project this year. She has been approaching students and getting it off, off the ground. Now, no, uh, sorry? You said two years. Yeah, exactly. Two years ago, were you not the welfare officer? Or am I not no, you, but you, you, you referenced that I've been running it for two years, and that is not the case. Certainly, I ran it last year. You would have seen our art week. Um, so if you came to the meeting and you saw our plans to go around university departments to do that awareness stage of the campaign. And you have also would have spoken to Izzy O'Neill, the, the former Tertiary Women's Rights Officer, who outlined again that the plan was to do the survey, was to raise the awareness, do the survey, come out with the, the guidelines, and then you'd be able to take tangible steps. And as far as I'm aware, that's exactly that's what's been happening. The President um, has met with the Vice-Chancellor, I think, just this week with NCUSA to discuss the steps of that project, to discuss exactly how the university is going to implement it, and we have full confidence that that's going to happen as part of this three-year plan the university has been moving on. Just uh, what, I'm, my, what I want to make clear is these actions are happening, and while I commend the, again, commend the efforts and fully support increasing the dialogue around this issue, and do agree it's not happening fast enough, and that's, that's completely fair, these are happening. We're not forgetting about this. We are still doing things. And I think that's what, you know, is the end goal. We're all working towards the same end point. Excellent. We'll leave there. Question. Uh, given, the, given that question was asked to the all the BP admin candidates, you can't just exclude us. It's a form of discernment. Okay. I'd just like to say this, this conversation needs to continue. If you want it, I've set up a, a Facebook page. It's called Polls 102 OU 2017. You want to jump into it. And on the subject of um, sexual violence on the CCTV cameras, they might act as a deterrent, so there's a catch-22. And what's wrong with you people, if you see it, hear it, getting people to report it? If you don't do anything about it, nothing's going to change. It doesn't happen on campus. The CCTV won't stop it. It happens at student parties. Yeah. Well, look, you know, you heard me shout, and you heard me hold people to account. That's what I'm going to do. And um, on this issue, I've joined with Kyra and I've joined with Monique, the uh, uh, presidential candidate for OUSA from the Justice Through Solidarity ticket. And that's basically where the name came from, Justice Through Solidarity, because we're interested in fairness and we're interested in um, something like uh, Shivanka said yesterday, equity. Sorry, that's not an endorsement, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> but um, there are some stringent rules on me at the moment. But, um, we joined forces together to bring this to the attention of the university and they came back to us and threatened us with legal proceedings. And then they went on to deny and call us malicious and unfair for writing a book about the timeline of the stories in which are also featured in that booklet and the action that we have demanded. 
um, for the safety of students and for the support of those people who are going through some extremely tough times. So if you uh, vote for the uh, Justice Through Solidarity ticket, you'll be voting for people who have direct experience with this subject and have taken the university head on wherever the chips may fall. Here you are, Sorry, what's the, what's the question? Yeah, we'll move on. Yeah, that's a better question. Uh, hey, I'm representing the uh, Student Animal Legal Defence Fund, so in conversations with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, we've uh, talked about having a student representative on the Animal Practice and Compliance Steering Group. Uh, now, uh, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Hugh uh, envisaged that this role would be performed by either the President, Post-Grade Officer or Education Officer. So my direct question today is directed at you three running for Education Officer and there's two parts. The first is how does ensuring student voices in generally, but in particular on animal related issues, are heard by the university fit into how you plan to fill the position of education officer? And secondly, how would you go about canvassing the views of students who are concerned about the university's use of animals and ensure these views are considered by the steering group? Cool. Um, so I'm vegan. <laughs> and um, no, I'm serious, but um, I think it's really cool what work you guys do. Um, and I think it really sucks to see how the university tries to dismiss um, campaigns around the lives and well-being of non-human animals and tries to delegitimize that and make out that um, you know it's the most efficient, best way of, of conducting research when you know there's a lot of um, com computer and technologically based uh, types of research that you can conduct as alternatives, um, and that's just not being acknowledged enough. Um, and so. I think when you look at this and you look at the way that the CCTV is being portrayed and the way that they're having a so-called consultation, when it very much is as if uh, the fate has already been decided, um, I think it's pretty pretty important to look at how um, the university says that they care about evidence-based research when it suits them. And so we've seen, this is a bit long-winded, but basically we've seen that with the CCTV they're like, they're ignoring all of the criminological, criminological research about how CCTV does not deter crime. And then when it comes to animal animal labs for research and so on, they're like, oh, we need to. And it's like, you really, like, you're, you're being very selective here. And so I think um, questioning when and how the university decides to base things on evidence-based research is really important. Um, and I'd really like to see um, that sort of campaigning around non-human animal issues to be given a bit more legitimacy and not so um, sort of dismissed, I guess. Um, sorry, what were the two? Could you like repeat the two parts of the I think we got our answer there. James, you want to? Not really. Uh, <laughs> the question not so much about the animal issue itself, but about student representation. Yeah. Um, I don't well, know. Tell I mean, us I'm, a second answer if we could, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think like having open discussions would be really great. Um, what we've been doing so far as a group is having like listening booths and stuff like that. Um, and I think sometimes having more informal conversations can be more helpful because when it's like a really um, sort of super professional thing, it can kind of deter students and like a lot of students are pushed for time and stuff. So I think bringing it up in an informal way and encouraging people to have those conversations, um, perhaps in a less like professionalized context, could be quite good. Um, so that's probably really big. But, yeah. Excellent. James? <laughs> yeah, so your question on student representation. So this year I've gained extensive experience on how to represent students well on committees and boards. And I think I can take that experience and apply it to this particular situation. The other part of your question was how would I properly engage your opinion? And I think communication is the big thing. I'm not going to go to the board with just my opinion itself. I'm going to talk to you, have the conversation with not just you, but your group as well. Getting them around the table and having this discussion. I think it would also be useful for me to be on the board, but also have a representative from your organisation on the board as well. We need to get these conversations going, and that's the key thing. Thank you very much, Jim. Yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of what um, James said. Uh, so we need to be listening to students. Um, I can't tell you exactly how we're going to do that, but ultimately um, we need to engage in dialogue on both sides, and then we need to use the platform that being on an OUSA executive gives us to take that um, to those who are making decisions like the Animal Lab and these sort of things. Um, 
I'm completely dissatisfied by the fact that oh, um, sorry, the university has made decisions like this with very little to no consultation. So it's definitely something we need to work on. We need to use, um, the, yeah, as I say, the platform that we have to to make make student voices heard. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is to the, the candidates that were on the ticket your voice last year. So full disclosure, I'm the current Vice President of OUSA, so my question is for James and Bryn, who are both running on the Unity ticket. Um, so you've said some interesting things today, so for one, you've said that the education officer requires experience, but the President doesn't require experience, which is quite an odd thing to say. You've said that your ticket will dissolve on election night. How can we have confidence in your ticket's ability to complete its goals? when your voice has yet to achieve one of its policies from last year and you gave up on your flagship policy one month into this year. So I can touch on you talking about the flagship policy. See, the issue with that flagship policy is that we were going into the exec wanting to do it, but the rest of the exec did not want to do it. You had Hugh who was going up adamantly against it and the rest of the exec. And the most important thing that I know you say here is United Exec. Is that the exec is approaching un issues United on not just one issue, not just one project that we're doing, but every single project we do, we, we do for that year. I'm saying that it's important that we move together forward as an exec. So we decided to drop that pro proposal in the best interest for the year. You know this, Will. We talked about this at the start of the bloody year. You know this question is? This question is a blatant attack, just for the pure purpose to make us look bad. You're better than that, Will. You know you're better than that, alright? Yeah, thank you for the question, Will. It's great to have the concern raised now rather than at the exec meeting at the start of the year. Um, I th your promises. Absolutely. We've followed through on many of our individual policies. I think James could talk at length about what he's done in the colleges. He's got on the ground. He's spoken to all the heads to the halls. And he's got his colleges committee running exactly as he said he would. Now, I myself, I've gone out and delivered better, academic, better support to our student academic groups. I've given them a spot all on my education committee. I've given them access to funding, given them more direct input into university measures. I'm running a pilot of the of the Facebook integration into some of the class rep systems, and we've been dealing, talking through that with Craig into our thing last year. We had plenty of policies last year. We were not just about food truck. But we, we went into this with a discussion at the start of the year, as to what makes our executive a team, I walked into Hugh's office and said, look, I do have concerns that if we push this through, it will drive the executive apart. At the end of the day, the executive has to prioritise its, uh, its combined ability to get things done over any one project. That is, a very under, um, that is the very reason we have unity. This is the idea that we don't see things as individual projects. We don't see this as individual tickets going in with individual ideas. This is an idea of what we think the executive as a whole should embody. And that is something we'll follow through on. Yes, we're saying the ticket will dissolve, but this, these ideas are not the ticket. These ideas are what we think OSA should be. And this is why we want to unite the executive to get these things done. This is the reason why, if as, as Will was in charge of executive training and planning, had run a planning session like I commit to doing, we would have had an executive plan for this year. We would have got these things done, had students knowing what we were going to get done, and be accountable for it for the entire year. We will commit to that now and promise you that, regardless of the makeup of this executive. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I've got a, just, a, just a question for Be Bold. Um, are you familiar with Ruby Sycamore Smith in 2014? Uh, real change in 2015. Uh, Hugh in 2016. Do you know what the overarching similarity with these uh, organisations or groups or people are? Uh, winning campaigns. Uh, <laughs> Jared Griffiths, you know? <laughs> Do you work for students or Jared? <laughs> um, students? Uh, I don't, what, what's the question? Do we, do we work for Jared? Well, you're no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've asked that. Hi, so I'm Monique and I'm running to hopefully be our student president for next year. So my question is actually for Bryn and all the educational um, candidates for next year. And that is, um, 
I'm, I'm a co-founder of Students Against Sexual Violence, and one of the biggest problems that I've encountered during my university career is how hard it is to withdraw from study because of mental health issues and because of sexual violence related trauma. And I just wanted to know your guys' feedback on that, and if you have any ideas on which ways that the withdrawal policy could be improved upon and made better for students. So is that through the education officers or? Okay. Yeah, well, um, absolutely, there's always room, I think, for improvement in university policies. Just last week, um, I was going for the student assessment policy, looking at ways to um, improve that, particularly a uh, key issue around uh, students who received their, their marks for internal assessments far too close to their end of year exams and the like. So there's always room for improvement. I don't know if you've had, had a discussion with Chris Stoddart, who does university policy. He's very um, welcoming. He's always happy to go and see students in the office and have a discussion about policy. Sorry? Absolutely. I'll give you his email straight after this. Awesome. That's great. Um, kia ora, Monique. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, so, in regards to making withdrawing easier and a more supportive, uh, less uh, disgustingly stressful process, um, that's something I've been deeply concerned about from how I've struggled with that myself, um, struggling with PTSD and um, friends of mine having similar difficulties relating to various other um, ongoing impairments, I suppose. Um, and so what I've done already is I attended the um, Sexual Harm Assault Response Evaluation Committee's HUI um, in December and raised some issues on that. I'm speaking to my own personal experience and what I think would be able to be implemented to make that easier. Um, on top of that, I've been um, speaking with um, a English lecturer of mine who's been speaking to various, um, I think there's like academic liaison, something rather. There's a lot of bureaucratic names in this institution, but some official position dude guy, um, and she's been trying to help me with um, getting that sort of bureaucratic mess shifting a bit, um, because getting the extensions and getting the withdrawals happening is actually currently really hard and really stressful, and you don't know if you're going to get a refund or not and stuff like that. Um, so currently, um, I've also I wrote a detailed account of how difficult it is, and I sent that to one of the women who was uh, one of the policy writers for the shared um, sexual violence draft policy. Um, she didn't email me back, which wasn't cool. Um, but I'm I'm definitely keen to keep continue fighting on that issue and writing and speaking and meeting with relevant people um, and speaking to that on the grounds of personal experience and that of the experience of my friends, um, people I know. So yeah. Yep, so there's definitely a lot of work can be done on this topic, but instead of telling you about it, I'm going to tell how you could do it. OUSA has seats on the Academic Committee, the Board of Undergraduate Studies, and the Senate. This is a trail of how things get passed up to university. So, on my role, I'll then pass the policy with the conversation with Chris Stoddart up these processes. These are the processes that an education officer needs to know. They need to know these processes, the bureaucratic loopholes you're talking about, if they want to work with this university and get things passed. It's so crucial about this information. Um, yeah, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge that I just recently read the report that you both wrote, and I want to say thank you so much for writing it. Um, it, yeah. um, it certainly made me aware of a lot of things that I wasn't aware of prior, um, and it gave me this deep sense of disgust quite honestly at the processes that exist um, we definitely need to change something around that um, it's it's unacceptable that sexual violence is not viewed with the importance that it should be in terms of the effects that come from that if you are physically injured or ill you get these kind of waivers um, and we need to be treating sexual violence with that level of with that little level of consideration at all more so in fact um, it needs to be brought to the forefront of the university's agenda, absolutely, and that's something that I commit to you that I will do. Um, yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. Are we got another question? Hey, so this is for Brent, and it's a bit blunt, but you've been on the executive for the past two years. You say, oh, well, you've agreed uh, that, oh, you say stagnant, but you've got all these great ideas. Um, you reckon that executive unity is what will, you know, have all these ideas come to life. Um, so if you've been on the exec for the past two years and exec unity is the problem, um, you're kind of the common denominator, so... So the question is, why would next year be different, your third year in the executive? Because I think the last two years have seen the issue of communication as being the big issue. And I think 
the role of administrative vice president, communication is their responsibility. Now I think for the first time we will have an administrative vice president next year who will follow through with their job description, who will meet with every executive officer regularly and filter that information back through the executive. I've been pushing for a number of these changes this year. Joe has written some very interesting executables and articles explaining um, the steps that we've been arguing for and lobbying for. I've not been silent about these issues. Was the Abbott VP silent in 2016 as well? The Abbott VP last year also didn't do meetings with fellow executive members. The cross-communication on the executive has been very poor. We've been operating in silos. Something I've been advocating for, something Jane's been advocating for. You may have noticed the executive roundup that we now do in executive meetings. That's been done because we as executive members have been struggling to get information from other executive members because there hasn't been any regular meetings. So what happens now is every executive member at the start of an executive meeting has a short time to have a, have, a, have a chat about what they're doing, what they're doing next week, and how people fit into that. Now I think ideas like that are brilliant, and I think we need to do more of that. And I absolutely wholeheartedly disagree that we've been part of the problem. I've been arguing all year to get these changes in place. And that's all you can do as an executive officer. I, another solution, I went out, so I was frustrated that the executive didn't have a big plan. We didn't have an idea of what everyone's doing. So I got a whiteboard marker, and if you've ever been in the executive office, you'll see this great big glass door. I went out there one day this year, when I was frustrated that not happening, and drew up a massive table, and wrote down what everyone was doing. And I wrote down all the different steps people were doing, and I wrote down what all the different things the executive as a whole were working towards. That allowed us and executives to walk into our office every day and see what everyone was doing. So I've been actively trying to improve the communication within our executive. I think it's been working. I think we've seen a greater level of cohesion over the last um, the semester in terms of the projects we run, and I think we can do far better with that sort of initiative next year. Excellent. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, hold on, we'll, we'll move on because I've got to cook dinner tonight at the flat, so we'll go for three more questions. Um, I'll, I'll go on from Sam here first, then we'll move on. All right, so um, this has been lampshaded a couple of times, so we haven't really gotten a proper um, answer to it. So this is for James, Bryn, and Cody. Um, so you, you've cited your experience on the executive as your qualification for the job next year. You've also talked about how Unity have a great working relationship with each other. And yet, when it comes to precedent, you're not endorsing the one person in the field who actually has executive experience and who you have a working relationship with. And you're instead endorsing someone with no executive experience. Why are you endorsing Finn and not Caitlin? For me, this is simple. Uh, I met Finn earlier this year, and we, we, we talked to each other. He's like, oh, how's it going, Cody? Good. Uh, what have you been up to? Oh, yeah, not much. Um, what, what are your plans for next year? Oh, I'm thinking of rerunning. Oh, great, great, great. OK, OK. What are you going to do? Uh, finance, I think. That's, that's what I've been doing. That's, that's what I'm good at. Yeah, great. OK, I'm thinking of running as well. How about we get together and form a ticket? Oh, excellent idea. I asked, uh, I asked our, our friend Caitlin, she's, we're good friends, I asked her a week before uh, the exec nominations if she was going to run and she said no, so I had no idea that she was running. Um, for me it was simple, talk to Finn, now we're mates, now we're on the ticket. Great. Yeah, so, Sam, does that answer the question or does anyone else want to answer? Bryn, do you want to say something to I just want to explain the divide as to why we think there's some experience need and why not. I think um, James has touched on the fact that education officer relies on having integral knowledge of university committees that I don't think you can pick up just off the fly. I, I genuinely think going into the education officer role, having done it this year, it takes time to learn because it's so foreign to much of the process we already know. And now look, absolutely, I asked Caitlin the very same question, whether she was running for the executive, and she said no. Um, we didn't know she was running, but even if, she, even if we knew that, my support would still be to fit. I think it's, it's helpful to have a, have a mix of experience and fresh ideas in the executive. I think there are specific roles that are more suited to having experience than others. But Finn was doing his due, due diligence long before I first spoke with him. He was meeting with people around the university, around OUSA, talking to students long before any of that. He's been involved in welfare campaigns, he's been involved in uni crew, he's been involved in countless things that shows he genuinely cares about affecting change for students. He genuinely connects with students when he talks with them. I think he'd be an outstanding president, and that's why I support Finn. Yeah. Excellent. I think we've got that question answered. Um, we've got one more question over here. Um, 
this is just to all of you. Um, the Dunedin City Council plays a vital role in governing Dunedin. They govern a large a portion of our everyday lives and provide services vital to the functioning of Dunedin. You mentioned the um, CCTV issue and the collaboration on that issue, but have made no mention of the proposed motion to release demographic data based on voting information in local body elections for the purposes of targeting underrepresented groups, which also raises privacy issues. At a recent council hearing, a councillor expressed concern over student underrepresentation in politics, meaning that we would be part of that underrepresented group was targeted. What are you planning to do to facilitate engagement between students and council, and will you promote um, better communication between OUSA and council? Um, I, I just before we begin, can we just give it 20 second uh, answers if we're going to go right across? Okay. Just, yeah, short answer, I think, um, if we can do some really bold um, work around the OUSA and make it um, a, an organisation that people actually look up to and get engaged with, that should um, get people more, as you see in this room, it's not full to the brim like it used to be. If we can increase engagement and make it more interesting and accessible to people, then we might see that representation in politics um, and also a working relationship with the Dunedin City Council is of course very important and something that we need to work to deliver the, the student voice to them. I think uh, it's, it's the role of the president to have the external face of the organisation, so definitely be, as far as an executive role goes, um, supporting the president in everything that they do and trying to help them uh, interact with the council. The issue with CCTV is that students are the prime stakeholders in that issue, and we were completely left out of that debate or conversation. I think it's more than communication, to be honest. I think it's actually about personal relationships with people and forging those relationships, maintaining those relationships, where, uh, whether that be with students or the counsellors, I think it's really important to have those relationships rather than just communicating all the time. If you really get along with them and you can um, actually have effective relationships, then you can get things done. Thank you. My answer is simply obvious. Let's bring the DCC onto our turf and let's ask them some questions about what they're doing and what processes uh, they are going to uh, go through to achieve those. Um, I'm a DCC native, <laughs> so like I've worked there for like seven and a half years, so I, I know that building inside and out, and I know a lot of people who work there, and I know their families as well, and I know a lot of people who are elected <laughs> members as well, I'm on first name basis with them uh, as well. Um, so basically, uh, we need to bring them here, um, onto campus so that we can actually question them and uh, see what they're all about and what's going on. Uh, absolutely, we need to be talking to DCC more. Uh, I'm particularly excited, uh, Roger, our, our campaign's candidate, has had a lot of experience on the Dunedin Youth, um, Youth Council for DCC, and I'm very excited to see what comes about from that and, and ways we can better engage with local council. I think the answer's obvious. Bring them here bring the Chief Executive Officer and a couple of senior members of DCC and put them right here so that we can talk to them about it. And also in the meantime, I've found a sponsor for a party on the night of the election for a sum of $200. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I don't know the families of our councillors, but um, I do think that a more open dialogue with local government is definitely beneficial for students. Hi, so I am currently the co-chair of Dunedin City Council's Youth Action Committee. Um, I work with Roger really closely, he's also on their leadership team and he's the co-chair of our Arts and Culture Subcommittee. So Roger is already doing heaps of work and getting the students voice, he's been running a survey around arts and culture things in Dunedin and we are really looking forward to working closer with OUSA to get more student engagement in the Dunedin City Council. That's what we're all about on Youth Action Committee, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I've been to a couple of local council meetings uh, for various submissions and stuff that I've been a part of, um, and it's quite an interesting experience. It feels a lot like going into the clock tower, um, and they feel very similar and bizarre, but um, I think it is worth engaging with them and, know, and letting them know that we are watching them and we are you know, going to be holding the t them to account for what they are doing. Um, and I think, yeah, definitely uh, trying to subvert that power dynamic, bring them here onto our, our home turf. And, um, and continuing the conversations with them and trying to build some good relationships with those who are willing to listen. Um, and already I've uh, been speaking with like um, the likes of Aaron Hawkins and, and Maria Lofiaso and um, talking about what are the pressing issues for our city. So 
it would be good to, to really build that relationship more and to put the pressure on them where it matters. So, yeah. I mean, absolutely, there seems to be only one right answer to this, isn't it? We want to you know, uh, increase engagement with the DCC. We all want to do this, and we're all saying it. So I think there's not really much else I can say. I, can, I absolutely agree with you. Of bringing DCC onto our turf, getting them to take us seriously, and having them round our table and talking with them, that is beautiful to hear, all right? So we're all agreeing on the same thing, so I'll just keep passing it on. Yeah, so we've all said the same thing 12 times, but I'll say it again. Um, I agree with Cam, we need to forge relationships and we need to, um, yeah, like everyone said, we need to, we need to communicate. Excellent. All right, last question. Hands up. We'll have a fight for it. <laughs> In an effort to get to know all of you guys, um, I was just wondering, who are you planning on voting for in this year's general election, and why, and how will that party help the students of Dunedin? Uh, so I am going to be voting for the Labour Party this year. Um, I am voting for the Labour Party because we need a change of government in the interest of students. Um, so the National Party has not done pretty much anything productive for students in the last nine years. Um, I want to see a government that's going to put us at the heart of it. Labor's already shown us that that's what they're going to do with a few of their tertiary policies. Yep, so I'm also going to be voting for the Labour Party this year. I actually mentioned it before in this forum that they're going to be increasing our student uh, borrowing costs by $50 a week. These are issues which are important to students and the Labour Party has listened. I, every party should be doing this, but from what I can see, the Labour Party are the only ones doing it for that particular issue, so I'll be putting my vote with them. Um, so I'm kind of tossing up between Labour and Green, some kind of Labour-Green combo, um, and that's because uh, Labour is going to be trying to um, fix how the National Party is messing up with the um, pay equity, like the gender pay equity bill, um, and it, the National Party has been really severely undermining that, and so Labour is aiming to, to change that bill to make it uh, stronger and more effective for uh, women getting equal pay. Um, on top of that, um, what the Labour Party is doing with um, giving students greater living costs and their sort of promises around uh, free education and the, public, uh, the new public hospital getting rebuilt, I think that's all really good stuff, and um, what the Green Party is suggesting around um, environmental policy, um, as well as, I think they had something good about um, uh, supporting survivors of domestic violence in relation to the workplace and giving them more sort of flexibility around leave and stuff like that. I think that's really, really, really important. Um, so, yeah, Labour, Green, fuck National, yeah. All right, perhaps we'll just, whichever party you're voting for, and then maybe one reason. <laughs> Labour and their mental health policy. Um, Labour, because we're going to legislate our climate, um, climate targets to suit the Paris Agreement and Kyoto agreement. Undecided for the reasons I explained before. <laughs> uh, I'm undecided at this stage, but I'm really focused on seeing which party is the best support for students, which, which party is the best rental um, standards out there, and which party is best looking at mental health, which at the moment is looking more like Labour. Okay, so uh, for my electorate vote, um, I'm going to be giving that to uh, Nikki Bold for the Greens, and I'll be also party voting the Greens this year too. Labour because they're going to give us 50 more dollars each in living costs and allowance next year. I'm um, going for national because I just don't think that uh, you know tax bar spend is the way to rule a country. Um, Labour, why? Same reason I'm running for for USA is because I'm not happy with the status quo and I think a lot more can be done. Excellent. No, thank you guys very much. Uh, I think we'll pull pin on this uh, debate there. Uh, it's been a long hour and a half, hour 40. So just a bit of a round of applause for all the candidates today and all the answers. And uh, thank you very much to everyone else for tuning up today. Uh, I will remind you that tomorrow at 11 o'clock we have the debate for the President's Forum. So I hope to see you all there. Um, come ready with your questions. Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy. <laughs>